Uh, I'm uh, Dr. Tim Lavinka. I'm a general urologist at Urology San Antonio. Um, about 40% of my practice is uh, neurourology and sexual medicine. So I also put myself on there as the Center for Female Sexual Medicine, but I do both male and female sexual medicine. Um, and then the remainder of my practice is general urology. But I developed an interest in MS and neurogenic bladder uh, early on in my practice for the lack of service for the rehab hospitals when I came into practice in 1991. In addition, um, our maid of honor in our wedding uh, and our very best friend uh, developed MS at about that same time and died two years ago in February at age 50, unfortunately. And so there's been both a professional as well as a deeply personal interest in M MS for me uh, and watching our very best friend go through this, uh, as well as several friends now that I call patients or patients that I call friends. Um, so I think that to not discuss sexual function and uh, bladder function in the same talk would be remiss because so many times I'm the only doctor that brings this up in MS patients. And um, I find that a great majority of them are aching to ask these questions of their <laughs> providers and there aren't a lot of answers. Uh, there are answers and they're good answers as you'll see in a moment. So let's talk about female sexual dysfunction. Um, and this is just uh, the overall types of sexual dysfunction in females. Um, over 40% of all women will get sexual dysfunction of one time, one type at some time in their lives. But low desire is the most common uh, in females, in MS and all females. Difficulties with arousal. And we have two types of arousal. We have psychological arousal. Well, you have psychological arousal. I, no, I have psychological. <laughs> yes, I have all these. That's right. But women have a different psychological arousal than men do, as we all know. And psychological arousal can be different from genital arousal. And men, they go together. I mean, it's pretty obvious what's going on when a guy's aroused, right? He's aroused down there, he's aroused up there. But women can be completely disjointed, and they can have what we call genital arousal with the typical sexual response of genital engorgement, clitoral elongation, vaginal lubrication, and yet their mind is not there. Their mind says, no, I'm not really there yet. So sometimes the problem in women with MS is that they will be aroused genitally, but their mind won't be aroused, or the other way around. They will have psychological arousal, but the genitals are just not going along with the program, and that can be a problem. And many times, difficulties with orgasm, and this is the most common problem in women with MS, just because you need so much nerve conduction to get to that point. And women can tell me, you know, yeah, everything's got to be just right a lot of times. And with MS, it's got to be more than just right. You've got to make sure that everything's just right and it has to be a good day for that to happen. And then for a lot of women, because mobility issues or lack of vaginal lubrication, sexual pain is a problem. So 40 to 70 percent of females with MS are affected, and I believe that's very, very underrepresented. Almost every woman I know with MS that I've seen who's had MS for more than a few years has some form of sexual dysfunction. And sometimes this is mobility, just can't get in the positions that make it fun anymore, or there's pain with it. Sometimes she has body image issues because of what the MS is doing to her body, and these are very important to women. Um, right now, there's no pink Viagra. We're looking for that. Unfortunately, a couple of things have fallen by the wayside. Um, there are things that we can do. And again, I think that aggressive treatment of vaginal dryness is very important. Um, and there's a huge controversy about female hormone replacement and the WHI studies and all that. And I'm not going to get into that, but to say that I apply the same philosophy for females with MS as I do for males. And that's because of the potential devastating effects of low male hormone levels, I should say low female hormone levels at an early age and what that might do to the aging process in a patient with MS, I think it's equally as important for women to, start to consider and start hormone replacement therapy at an early age. And you must weigh benefit against risk. And the problem is right now with female hormone replacement therapy, all we're looking at is that pendulum in the risk direction. We are not looking at benefit and quality of life. And for a lot of my MS patients, this is a critical thing for cognitive function. I give them a little testosterone because all women need a little testosterone. Not only does that happen, help desire, 
but it also helps muscle mass. It also helps cognitive ability and memory. It helps agility and reflexes. So those are the things, and I don't want to get into the kind of gender stuff about that, but the bottom line is that those are the things that help women with testosterone. And estrogen obviously helps a lot of the anti-aging things, bone mineral density, uh, quality of uh, the sexual response. All of those things are helped with estrogen. So I think it's also very important to be aggressive and certainly weigh benefit at least equally against risk in hormone replacement therapy in uh, women patients with MS. So let's look at some common things, themes with both sexes. Many times we have to consider the impact on the partner. You'll have a woman who's young, who's no longer having sexual desire and has a very young partner. Same thing I gave you uh, in reverse about the male who has low desire and his partner may take this to heart. Uh, Typically, we're concerned that our partner no longer is attracted to us, and that, that could be the farthest thing. Um, we certainly need this physical touch when we are going through a chronic disease, and we certainly need this most from our partner. I think it's very important to recognize that things have to change. What you considered a Fourth of July fireworks display in the past is no longer the case. You have to redefine what you consider good sex, what we call a satisfying sexual encounter in the business. No wonder we can't get these studies to be done. If, what's a satisfying sexual encounter? Um, but mo there you go. That's why I said July Fourth fireworks, a sparkler. It doesn't have to be, you know, it doesn't have to be here all the time, right? Um, so mobility issues and weakness can be a, a big issue for a lot of patients. And many times it's very important to say, you know, I'm at my strongest from about eight to ten in the morning, and I get weak after that. And so that's when we should make love. You know, call your boss, tell him you're going to be late. And tell them you got a very good reason, you know. So some of the takeaway messages about both bladder and sexual issues is that it's really important to coordinate your care between your primary care docs, your neurologist, and your specialist. Make sure we communicate. This is a multifaceted problem, multifaceted disease, and it requires a multifaceted input from your doctors. It's hard these days. Some of the hardest things to do are to pick up the phone and call a doc sometimes in the middle of a busy day. But sometimes that's necessary to make sure that uh, care is coordinated. Recognize that your that bladder and sexual issues can be treated. Don't let somebody tell you no. It's very rare that we say this is the best we can do and there's nothing that we can do for you. And make sure that you go see a specialist when you're not getting the answers that you want. And I believe that's it. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.